Do I need a suit coat on? A jacket? No, you're fine. You are fine. <laughs> I know the weather is good. Mm -hmm. I saw your, I like your plant up there. Uh oh. <laughs> and I like the color. I said, you, that's, um, I always right. like looking at people's background, their backdrops. Yeah. yeah. All right, we're live. It's time for Love Your Bones, Dr. Keith. Hey, hey, Ricky. We're a well, week late, but we're here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's it's uh, March. It's March. It's and Women we got, Women's Her Story Month, and we got a Shiro on the line with us today. Right, Shiro. A super Shiro. You know, I'm. You know, it's my it's my purpose to bring you beautiful women. I said, well, you know, every woman that you brought on, every woman's story, every woman is beautiful. Yeah. And Our so objective is to always make that shine. Wonderful. So, so we, my precious. So, so we say, you are already beautiful. You just need to go out and just be. <laughs> oh my like that. <laughs> get that line, Doctor. Okay, I, yeah, I just me. I said I was inspired by today's show. <laughs> <laughs> I said you. You just need to just go out and just be. And just me. I like that. I love it. I love it. So who are you? Tell everybody who you are, my friend. If you... Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ifi Wabuku. I'm the CEO for the African Women's Cancer Awareness Association. I'm very, very glad to say that I am a breast cancer survivor seven years and counting and thriving. And uh, we definitely, I'm in the cancer field. We work with women who present with breast cancer. We do a lot of education, especially geared to African immigrants. Uh, we do more education in the communities. Um, gear them into going for early screening. And when diagnosed with breast cancer, we also have trained patient navigators that work with them. And finally, they work with them through the continuum of care. Once you're done and God willing, you're cancer free, we also have a uh, breast cancer support group called the Roko Women's Breast Cancer Support Group. The Roko tree is, uh, you know, the gigantic, big rooted uh, tree with so many branches and leaves. So we encourage all women with breast cancer join us so we can continue the fight. I'm glad to be here today. And I know that with breast cancer, you're not only dealing with the disease of breast cancer. There are other factors that we need to know to help continue the healing and to continue staying healthy as individuals. So thank you for having me. I'm glad to be here. Great, great, great. And with breast cancer comes side effects like bone issues. You know, and that's what we talk about, but we're so glad to have you and so proud of the work that you're doing. And you're also a nurse. Tell people that. Yeah. Mm. I'm also a nurse and I'm also a nurse practitioner. So I'm glad uh, to wear that hat because it allows you not only to empathize with people when they're in it, but you're able to counsel them. Uh, with my new nurse practitioner hat, I'm able to also work with uh, women and be able to uh, follow them and make sure that they are getting the right uh, treatment and that they are following up on whatever they are expected to do. That's awesome. That's awesome. And where are you from? I am proudly a Nigerian. Very proud to be a Nigerian. I'm an African, even though I've lived in this continent for half of my lifetime. So I'm very, very happy to be who I am. And also knowing that I am considered Black and I'm proud to be Black. I love it. 
I love it. So you're bringing lots of stuff to talk about, you know, your cancer, your heritage, your shironess, your being a founder, your, you know, your recovery and your support for your patients. And it's all like amazing, amazing work, my friend, my shiro. <laughs> so, and and at the end of the episode, we'll talk about our, our new project, you guys, a little bit, but, but, um, you know, I think that, that, um, and you're primarily in the DC area, right? Like, yes, we primarily are in um, the national capital area, Maryland, uh, D.C., and Virginia. We also have an office in Atlanta, Georgia, but um, we're hoping to really go national. Uh, internationally, we're also out there in the Africa we opening up uh, this August in Abuja, which is the capital of Nigeria. But we visited a lot of African countries like Tanzania, Sierra Leone, Sudan, Cameroon, Morocco. And uh, hopefully we would like to continue our work in all the African countries. But most especially because I'm resident here, we want to continue collaborating, forming partnerships uh, with organizations like TOUCH so we can continue to touch lives and make a difference in the lives of both men and women who are diagnosed with breast cancer. Wow. So if you one time you told me that um, you were celebrating 20 years, so did you have your foundation before you had breast cancer? Absolutely. Um, the organization will be 20 years old this year, thank God. But the organization uh, was started not because of my diagnosis. Uh, but it was started uh, because of uh, two women who um, I will say very personal. One of them is my mother. She was diagnosed with breast cancer in 1989 when she came here to visit me. I had no idea she had breast cancer. Uh, on a routine visit to her doctor, that's when it was found out. And because she was visiting, um, she, she was barely three months old when this happened. Unfortunately, in those days, it was a little bit cumbersome to get her insurance. But I did have a wonderful uh, best friend who was a medical doctor. So she got her peers together and my mother was able to get a mastectomy and all the treatment that followed. My mother survived. She lived another 17 years and died at the ripe age of 84. But the cancer came back 17 years later. That wow. applies to her lungs and that's what took her life. Now, going backwards again, my best friend who was a trauma surgeon was diagnosed with breast cancer 12 years after my mother's diagnosis. Wow. So we were so sure that she will make it, but uh, she fought her cancer for six years and then she passed on. So I started the organization because of these two women that meant a lot to me. And one of the things that I learned from their journey and their issues, was that breast cancer does not discriminate. It does not uh, understand educational level because my mother barely had a high school uh, certification. And here is a um, trauma surgeon who is a medical doctor. Yet she was diagnosed with breast cancer, yet she also died from it. So that was my driving force in starting the organization. And wow. um, I'd like to say that <laughs> um, that's how I started. And I never thought I'll be one of them too. 
but in 2016, uh, on a routine uh, breast cancer screening, I also was diagnosed with breast cancer. So I ended up with double mastectomy. And uh, unfortunately, I'm one of the small percentage that uh, the mastectomy on one on my left breast uh, didn't go too well. So I ended up losing that breast completely and decided not to go for any more plastic surgery because I did that twice and uh, it didn't turn out too well. So I'm glad to be alive and to use my experiences to help other women because that's what is important is to make sure that no woman who is diagnosed with breast cancer walks through this journey or through this road alone. So we're happy to be here to support any woman, uh, lend and hold their hands and see what we can do to make it a better world and to continue to walk and hope that someday there'll be a cure for breast cancer. Yeah, we got to fight for that. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Did you have genetic testing? Do you have any genetic mutations like from your mom? I Yes. I'm glad you brought that up. So I did have genetic testing. And of course, uh, like I said, my mom had it. And uh, while we're on this topic, one of the things I'll encourage us uh, people of color to do is to make sure you know your family health history. We never seem to talk about our family health history. Uh, either we don't know or those who know have passed on. But for us who are here, I believe we all owe our children passing down the health history. So that allows them to make more sensible decisions about their health. Um, so mine was uh, genetic. Uh, like I said, I have no idea. I know of one aunt who also had breast cancer. Outside of that, I didn't know much history about my maternal or paternal grandparents. Neither do I know down the line. Were you BRCA positive? Yeah. So all these are uh, things that... Uh, drive us to continue learning and hopefully uh, making changes. Do you, do um, I wanted to ask you a quick question. Um, um, when we, if we would just look at Nigerian women and focusing there, and we talk about the incidence of prostate cancer in Nigerian women, mm -hmm. okay, um, compared to the incidence of, of breast cancer in the United States. Is there a difference in the number of women um, in Nigeria per 100,000? Yes. Okay, two things. First and foremost, uh, just yesterday, I was talking to the head of uh, radiotherapy and oncology at the uh, main hospital in Abuja, which is the capital city. Mm -hmm. She tells me that the biggest issue for her, who is the head of uh, clinical oncology, is women presenting late mm -hmm. with breast cancer. So that's late troublesome. Stage, late, stage, late stage, yeah. Late stage, that yeah. is troublesome. She said almost 40% of the uh, number of women in particular that she sees present between stage three and stage four. So uh, that tells me that uh, there, are, there are changes that we need to do. There's no uh, reason or excuse. There are quite a number of factors that lead up to that, but changes can be made to decrease the incidence and the percentage of women presenting late. Now, when you talk of uh, the my other sisters right here in the diaspora, we have the advantage 
of knowing, first of all, the education, secondly, the accessibility to being able to go for early screening where they are. Uh, there might be minor challenges either for insurance or, um, you know, having papers, uh, documentation, which unfortunately documentation has nothing to do with you going for early screening. There are resources out there in the United States. So we cannot be in this environment. Hopefully there might be few challenges because sometimes when we refer women for screening, there are certain criteria that has to be met. So I'm not mm -hmm. saying that it's trouble free out here. Right. Yeah, but we're more at an advantage here than we are back home. Mm -hmm. uh, back home, the accessibility, you don't have um, screening centers uh, everywhere. Maybe in the bigger cities, they are more accessible. But when you come to the villages and the inner cities or inner places, you may not have one within so much uh, mile radius. So that creates a problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was wondering, because are we talking about, when we talk about the diaspora mm -hmm. and the what is the incidence in Nigeria versus what's the incidence in the United States as it relates to to um, to people um, that are women that are of the diaspora. So because we know um, what's the uh, we know what the incidence here, you know, the in the United States is, but is it a higher incidence yeah. in Nigeria or is it the same? I mean, because you're in the diaspora, it doesn't matter whether or not you're in Nigeria or whether you're in South Africa, or whether you're in Gabon, um, if you're, if you have yeah. ancestry, your incidence is X. So that, because it that's- is. It mm. is higher. It definitely is it's higher. A higher. It's a higher. Okay, I thought it was less in Africa, but you would know better than me. Um, yeah, and the, more, it, and the mortality rates are higher too, for sure. Oh, the mortality. Yeah. You God help us. Yeah, the mortality rate is much higher. I think um, Virginia Commonwealth University uh, with Dr. Shepard, they had just come back sometime last year and. Uh, if I remember correctly, if I'm wrong, I'll come back online to correct it. They had an article that said about 52% mortality rate of all those diagnosed. And I think that is very, wow. that is very disheartening. It is disheartening. Yeah. But like I, I think said, I am. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, I definitely will check on that percentage again. Mm. Yeah, check on that for us, because I also heard something too, like there's some very high percentage of metastatic de novo disease. So people get diagnosed at metastatic from the from the beginning. So right. I don't yeah. know what the data is, but I think that's way higher in Africa. Oh, yeah. You know, so that, that is very uh, yeah. I mean, yeah, we don't have screening, that, we don't have yeah. screening there, right? We don't really have right. screening. And, and so the and so that's why what we're doing is going to be very important is because now we can create not, we don't have to have a, a mammogram screen. You may be able to do um, an exosome screen or, or look for genetic information that's found in the body fluids. Mm -hmm. And if you're a high risk, which we would say that all women would be at high Everybody risk. black is high risk. Everybody so, black is high so risk. Every, so it's, so mm -hmm. we can screen early and look for those markers, those mm -hmm. biomarkers that exist in the serum. Um, yeah. And now that'll change that mortality rate because you're not going to have mobile units, MRIs, or mammogram screening facilities all over the country. You're right. And it's, if you if you do, you're always going to have uh, what Nigeria's population is over 150 million. Oh yeah. 75 almost million. Almost 200. Mm -hmm. no, almost 200. So we're at two. You have 200, and so that's 100 million women that's going to be have to be screened. Well, wow. I mean, if they reach. Yeah. Oh, for 30 by 30 let's say 20. Wow. 20. Yeah, because we don't even know. We don't know 
what we don't know. Right. That's the fact because no one's you you can't search and pull information out about African women and breast cancer mm-hmm. and risk. It, it's it, right. it, it, there's not a lot of information out there. Right. Wow, wow, wow. So let's talk about bones a little bit. We actually had a comment from Sandra Bell. Sandra says, um, bone health is important. I can't begin to tell you how good I felt when my doctor said that all the working out and, and walking and running had actually improved my bones and new bone had had grown. It's not, not about, it's not spoken about a, a lot in our community, but bone health is really important. So that's awesome, awesome, Sandra. So she basically is saying that she did the right thing by her bones and got a compliment from her doctor as opposed yep. to having an issue. So is that true if you if you're active and you're working out, Keith? Does that strengthen yeah, I mean, your bone? It, it's well, there's a couple of things too. If you're active, that means and you're outside walking, you're getting a double whammy because you're getting your vitamin D. In the sun. Exercise. And so what's interesting that people don't recognize, people when they think of bones, they think bones are this inanimate object. It's like uh, a leg on a chair. But bones are living. And the way bones get stronger is the more pressure you put on it. The more weight you put on it, the stronger bones get. So the less weight, the weaker they become. And so that's just the fundamental physiology of way bones strengthen so the 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 person in the audience who said that they're out walking and running and and they probably changed their diet and that was a question that's why that's why chemo is so bad because chemo not only the drugs affect your bones but also you have less ability to walk and have energy to like take a walk every day you know i mean like some people take walks all the time but because you're not as active because you don't feel well, that probably makes it worse, right? Yeah. If you're not feeling good. <laughs> so I, I was, the other thing too, is that I'm trying to, because if, when we start talking about bone health, and since we have a nurse practitioner on board, she can give us some insight as with <laughs> um, lactose intolerance in, in, in women of the diaspora. Is that something that's common or is that only here in the United States? I would not want to speak with certainty on that uh, because back home, or at least in Africa, I must say that uh, in most parts of uh, the, you know, the countries, we go on fresh food and fresh milk with uh, a lot of uh, Western civilization, we start, you know, coming to processed food and processed milk. So we definitely have uh, most of our fathers, mothers that do a lot of, I hear you talk about uh, when you work hard, the bone, you know, takes it more. They do a lot of walking, a lot of uh, going to the farm. So they are exercising without knowing that, you know, Mm. that's what they do every day. The women walk to the market, walk to church. So even though it looks like um, they are not, uh, you know, really living the good life, but these are things that they do subconsciously. It's part of them. So they are much stronger than mm. us who, who are here. Well, see, see, riding the other, the- <laughs> all the people that live in a good life going back to trying that's to right. get the steps in. It's just like, well, maybe I just need to walk to church. And that's and right. Park. Yeah. So yeah, they, I- they do that, you know, it's part of life. I was home in December and they have to... um you know that you have a driver they drive you all the way to the door of the church and you see all these other women you know coming in they are looking strong and nice and everything and i'm like wait a minute what am i missing 
church is over, they still drive the car so to the door. But every other person is smartly going home happy. Mm -hmm. So um, it's wonderful to have all the amenities, but like you rightly said, I think we need to do a little bit more for ourselves to be able to enjoy these wonderful, amazing amenities. Because mm -hmm. that was when I, what I was gonna highlight when we start talking about bone health, we, we spoke about cancer mm -hmm. and cancer's role in interfering with good bone health. But then, and I brought up the issue of, of, of disease and like autoimmune diseases. And so the reason why I bring this up is because autoimmune like lupus, for example. And so when we think about lupus and autoimmune disease, we have a lot of lupus in the United States affecting people um, of, uh, of African ancestry. But the question when we go home, is that the same experience or because we have these dietary differences or exercise differences or matter of fact if we're out if you're walking you're out in the sun and if you're out in the sun you're getting your vitamin d yeah because the majority of of people once you come to the, to the u.s or once you're in the u.s and especially in the north you're not getting your vitamin d from the sun and and the majority of us are vitamin d deficient and so those are vitamin D. You brought up this today about diet. And the reason why I was acting, looking for lactose intolerance was because now I'm from the country. So I know what goat milk is versus cow milk. Mm -hmm. And and a lot of relatives we had had allergies to cow milk, but we would drink goat milk. And then we, as we got older, it says, we, you know, everybody's drinking, you know, milk. And if you had a little bit of indigestion, that was just, you know, um, part and parcel of, of what was the norm. So looking at, at how, and, and it was a very important point that you brought up. If you compare home versus what happens when you get to the United States, you're not walking to church anymore. You're not walking to the market anymore. You're popping in your car and driving over to Whole Foods to get fresh vegetables. Okay. And then you're going to get in your car and drive back home. So I bring that up because all these things, cancer, autoimmune disease, lactose intolerance, the yeah. lack of vitamin D play a very important role in right. bone health and in developing osteoporosis. Right. Right. Can you talk some more about osteoporosis? Because that's some one of the things we uh, have and don't know how best to deal with it. Well, well, so we kind of hit on it. So what was very interesting is, is now, say, for example, vitamin D. The if you're in the U.S., it doesn't matter where you may be from, but if you've lived here and you live, like especially in the Washington D.C. area, a large percentage of people in Washington D.C. area are going to be vitamin D deficient. Vitamin vitamin D is needed for healthy bones. Yeah, okay. I brought up that issue of lactose intolerance. Well, why is that that important? Well, that's where you're going to get your calcium from. So if you're not drinking a lot or drinking or eating dairy products that are milk-based, where are you getting your calcium from? So if you're not supplementing your calcium, supplementing your vitamin D, where are you getting it from? Well, can and, you get it from other kinds of milk, like oat milk or, or, or goat milk or other things, or does it have to come from cow's milk, which is, everybody, makes everybody sick? Well, no. I mean, there are, you can get it from other sources, but uh, even there's something very interesting, even um, they break milk up into A A1 versus A2 milk and A1 milk people, um, you know, A2 milk people tolerate extremely well so they can get their calcium from that. What or, does that mean? What is A2 milk? I never well, heard of it. What's an interesting concept and, and just, so around the world, there are cows that produce A1 protein, okay? And there's a cows that produce A2 protein. So there are these different dairies that produce it outside the United States. 
Now, the A1 protein causes a lot of GI distress and digestion problems because it's high. It's 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 um it's it's protein is hard to digest and it causes a lot of gut inflammation, which causes this distress. In the United States, we just happen to mate the A the cows that produce A1 protein with the K2 protein, and we mixed it up. And so now, majority of people are are drinking. Um, um, milk that have both the protein, both the proteins in them, where if you go to your market, you may find um, a milk that's specifically from an A2 cow. And then that may be something that you can ingest and tolerate extremely well. And so the, that's important. Goat milk, it, it, you can, or you just have to be supplemented with calcium. So I mean, so take a pill. Yeah, nobody's going to get that whole A1 and A2 thing. I can't keep track of that. Keep all right. Track. But see, but they did. You know what's interesting? You know what's interesting? If you, go, if, you, if you go to the market and ask for A2, it's a big sign. It says A2. It's just like, oh, that's what Keith was talking about. I said, yeah. But you're, but you're right. And it, it, it may not be there. So then you're going to have to get your 1,000 milligrams in a of pill. calcium a day. Yeah, now you can get that in your orange juice. You can get that in your bread. All these things that are fortified with calcium, you can get those there. But but the most important thing is to recognize you need to be ingesting calcium somewhere. You got to get it. It's got to come from somewhere. Somewhere. Hmm, all right. Well, and then I tell everybody I'm speaking at a very high level, very general, not trying to dig down into the the nuts and bolts of 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 the science behind uh, calcium and vitamin D, we're just saying that that from educational purposes is that you need to talk with your doctor about vitamin D supplements. You need to ask on your next physical what's your vitamin D level, because a lot of people don't. I mean, think about it. So fundamentally, black people, people of 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 African ancestry get there, we're getting their vitamin D in the sun. And it's, if we're not out in the sun, we don't get it. Getting it. And we're running around at a deficiency, which plays a role in our immune system. It plays a role in building healthy bones, but also it plays a role in protecting against cancers. Yeah. Iffy, when did you have your first bone scan? Did you have one before you had cancer? Honestly, I would say no. <laughs> Me either. Me either. I honestly, never heard of it until I, until I, answered. and it wasn't until I was way into chemo before I even got one. Yeah. So it, it's a question. So being in the healthcare profession, what do they say about bone scans, especially a nurse practitioner? So you, you're the boots on the ground. You're coming in contact with people, edu not only treating people, but educating people about their health. You're at the front line. So what were you being taught right. about bone health? That, that's, a, that's a good question. And that's what we now have to deal with is to make sure that, uh, you know, for healthy bones, uh, just like you have rightly said, we need to do all the right things, make sure your, your vitamin D level, uh, eat well, exercise, and do all that it takes to make sure you have healthy bone, your calcium, all of that, all inclusive. Mm -hmm. So these are things we never really pay attention to until uh, you go to the doctor and then you're being told that you have either severe osteoarthritis or osteoporosis and your bones are now beginning to crackle. So I believe one of the things we need to do sometimes is more like going back to the basics and doing all those things that uh, we think our mothers and fathers did and you're thinking, oh, that's because they can afford the car, or they can afford this. But these are things that made them stronger. Stronger, right? Yeah. So let me ask you a question. So if, let's go back and then let's talk about, um, because, you know, 
we're not talking about drive throughs If going back home, when you start talking about green leafy vegetables. And so going you know, to get it yourself walking. You got to walk to get it. And then what you have is, you know, we know that collard greens, we know that broccoli, Brussels sprouts, and green leafy vegetables are a source of calcium. Mm -hmm. And so can you think of dishes that you prepare that people could take advantage of on this call that, Absolutely. that have good calcium content? Right. So one of the things I must say for at least uh, from my circle of friends uh, they have been doing lately is also to plant these green leafy vegetables in their yard. Mm -hmm. Most of us have nice yards. So uh, we have a circle of friends where you take advantage and right. pride ourselves. I planted the bitter leaf, you can come and get some. So we do have uh, quite a number of uh, green leafy vegetables. So you make different sauces with it. And that's why I say maybe one of the few things we need to do is start going back to the basics. Yeah. So you can go to your yard, go just open the door and you know pluck all those uh, vegetables. Actually, there's one of the soup we call vegetable soup. Right. So it has your tomatoes. It has, I mean, a whole lot of uh, vegetable. We call it greens, the green. So those type of uh, soups are very rich, the cassava leaf soup. Right. Yeah. So what I tell uh, my friends, at least, is that the way our forefathers, mothers cooked, there was nothing wrong with it. Now, with education, you can say, oh, that's too much fat in this. Uh, palm oil is not good for it. All we need is just modification mm. to modify maybe right. the content of what we're eating now because we don't exercise like they used to. Mm. But so, you, you, you said you said a very important thing, mm -hmm. and that was going back to basics. Yes, going back. love that because it right there we didn't have a microwave. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. we didn't have drive through because those two, if the microwave and drive through, moved oh, us from preparing our foods mm -hmm. uh, right. on the stove. You know, getting fresh vegetables, popping peas, and. and string beans and making collard right. greens and, and those greeny green vegetables that have a lot of calcium in it to yeah. purchase stuff that had, I mean, we could conceivably go a whole day without eat, eating any green vegetables. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, also go back for one second. So think about also how we cook greens. Right. Like we cook the life out of them, right? And we cook them with like, Bad things, you know what I mean? Well, like, well, see, can I ask you a question? Yeah. What are bad things? Because if if you look at it, I can go into my cabinet, right? Well, not now, but in the past, I could go in there and look at something I had in the refrigerator, and I don't even understand fifty percent, ninety percent of the words that are on the ingredients. So those are oh, a whole yeah. bunch of bad things. Oh yeah. But if, if you went in and got, even if they did it, you know, if you took greens and you changed your diet, mm -hmm. and you didn't get processed foods, processed meats, and had natural stuff, and you know, nutritional yeast, uh, onion powder, and you're cooking your food, and you may throw some bacon fat in it or whatever, but the point is, you know it was basically created with a small number of ingredients versus- So, you, so well, I can use the bacon fat, and I can use the ham hocks, and, and all that stuff that I cooked them with. Well, the point okay. is, if you're, gonna, if you're gonna shift in that direction, don't make a partial shift. You got to be a full. There had to be a full shift. Okay, because, what's that? Like, like, I mean, um, um, we're talking about everything in moderation, but fresh vegetables. Okay. Do you, well, I, I, do you drink sodas? Nope. Okay. Do you know how many people drink sodas? Yep. Yeah. I used to work for Coke. You know, I stopped drinking soda when I left Coke. See? Oh, really? yeah, but um but um 
you know, how many people get 70, 60 to 70 ounces just water a day? No, yeah. no, we know that. Yeah. I don't have a problem with coffee and teas, but the point is, is there sodas? They're out there. I'm not trying to beat up the soda industry or anything like that, but our body need, especially as we get older, we need to start to change our diet. You know, we're not like a new car. With new car, we can beat it up. I said, as you get older, you got to make sure we got we got the right oil in there. I got to put fuel additive. I got to make sure the tires and the brakes are okay. So, so <laughs> what I'm saying is is that we have to begin eating healthy. We have to better manage our bodies. Right, right. And that's what's important. And right, we have to um, educate ourselves because our doctors are not our managers. Our doctors are our consultants. The healthcare professionals are the consultants. And we, as an individual, as people, need to take better control of their food, be more educated about what are you eating. Yeah. And I think to your point, though, about as we get older, you know, I think we got to start young. Like we got to start with my my daughter and my son in law are so. (laughs) discipline i know i know you know i have like the lollipop stash of course you know grandma has everything yeah, but, see, but see you grandmama see, see I, know, grandma, grandma, yeah, grandma. I know i know they only get it at my house but, see, but that's that's always been the grandmama situation yeah i know that that's we can't help her. because we can't help i did when i was a kid i said come on when i was a kid i said we only had dessert on sundays because grandma made it yeah and it was a in you know a pie or a banana pudding ice cream a banana right. pudding or something like that. And we had it. And then the whole week, maybe at school, if we're good at school, we got chocolate milk. That's a treat. <laughs> well, it's Friday. Funny. You know, my, my stepdad is 92, right? So he's been like, really, probably since Christmas, he's been asking me for an apple pie. Aww. So so every time I see him. So finally, I made him an apple pie the other day. When, before I went to London, I brought him an apple pie. And, and his dinner from the caregiver was sitting on the counter lamb chops and mashed potatoes and string beans like this lovely dinner and when he saw my pie do you think he ate those lamb chops no my mother said he probably ate a quarter of the pie for dinner that night (laughs) and so now i have to like confess to the caregiver that i had screwed up his dinner and not you know not held the pie but but you know he's like a little kid like he wanted his pie and that's how the kids are but but um i think we should just all of us need to do better all of us need to do better from right. age and start and learn this way because you know my kids didn't even know what candy was until they went to school they thought strawberries and grapes were candy i mean until she came home from first grade one time mom i had this brown gushy stuff that i traded my strawberries for it was chocolate she had never <laughs> eaten chocolate so but i think we have to yeah. we have to do better see, with our see, and you see what i'm talking about because the only time i remember candy was halloween <laughs> <laughs> and then your mother took it all, right? They took it all. I said, you can't eat it when you're, while said, you're out in the street, uh, right? Bring it home before no, you. No, bring it home. I said, bring it home. Next, next yeah, thing, I, no, it's, 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 I it's quite on. agree with what both of you are saying. We have to start it early with our kids. Yeah. And our grandkids. Yeah, because uh, my grandkids in Atlanta, Georgia, their mother is doing a fantastic job. She makes muffin only with vegetables, zucchini, carrots, uh, you name it. And she makes sure that her kids, even when they go out for Halloween, she takes all the candy and <laughs> put it away. Doesn't care. Yeah. Right. right. And the kids are just growing wonderfully. And yeah. you can tell. And I'm saying, how did I miss that? So I'm so proud of her. I know, my she, kids too. Because I feel definitely... very happy I'm talking about it. She really <laughs> makes sure her kids eat right. So she cooks most of the food herself. And she really, really goes out of her way to make sure that um, whatever she's cooking, is a good natural food for the kids. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but that's because it it becomes their normal. Yeah, well, right? I mean, it becomes but, their normal, and they're not. You know, it's not like you're depriving them of something. Like I see no. these kids. So when you take away the lollipops, you take away the, you know, whatever the the, the chocolate, the cold. Mm-hmm. The cold. Yeah. or they have like an emotional connection to this stuff because 
it becomes something that you punish them for or something that you reward them with. I mean, you know, there's so many things tied to food and eating, right? Right. If you just, if you're normal is to eat broccoli, then they, they're cool. That, exactly. Right? So my we, come over here and go crazy because they can't get it at home. But then we, but I also like, okay, you three lollipops in the next three hours is all you get. Right? <laughs> I see. And then, and then what's interesting, even when you go to school, when yeah. we go to school, when the kids are going to school now, they weren't going to school when we went, like we went to school because they had um, food that was prepared by cooks who right. knew how to cook. When, when I was a kid, I, you know, in, in South and in Texas, and even my, one of my cousins, she ran a kitchen in East Texas and, and they would make fresh foods and kids would not be jumping around. So they would have breakfast at home, which wasn't a cup of coffee and a donut. They would have a sound breakfast, make it to school, have a nice lunch. And they didn't have all this activity, people, going, you know, activity at school. And then you, between recess, where you got your exercise in, and then after lunch, you went out and played. And then sports after school, all you can do is be ready to go to bed at eight o'clock at night. Right. But right. well, even, even when you make your kids lunches, you know, Costco makes it so easy to get that big box of little bags of cookies, that big box, right? Yes, and I'm like, I, used to, I used to like on Sundays, I would cut up, I have like five different melons and put everything in bags and put like bags of fruit. So that I had them for the whole week. And that's what my kids ate for lunch, but um, with, you know, with the PB and J or something. But mm -hmm. but now it's like, just grab the, grab the it, it, box. It's so easy to grab what we consider to be dessert and a treat. And mm -hmm. that becomes your staple. Right. Because like, Chip Ahoy, the, only, the only cookie I knew was a Chip Ahoy. Yeah, Chip Ahoy. I, I did Chip Ahoy, and, and, and you could only get Chip Ahoy oh, yeah. maybe on the weekends with a with a glass of milk. You may get an Oreo cookie, and you could twist it off and lick the cream or uh, scratch yeah. the cream off. <laughs> but that's all you were getting, and that's it. Now, yeah. it's every day. In the schools, they have... You know. nutrition and the more sugary stuff is sh or sugar than they have nutritional stuff right anytime a kid's going out to, you know walk by the high school and they're stopping at the starbucks getting coffee in the morning oh yeah and I, well, my starbucks is packed with with um with bopper that yeah you know, they come from school go to starbucks but all right i got another topic before we go up there so so um, you know, Jerry, she was on the show, my friend Jerry, she just had a partial knee replacement. So I know, I know that joints are different from bones, right? I mean, I, I got that. But I have so many of my friends who now in their 50s and 60s are getting knee replacement surgery. It's like almost like a knee epidemic of everybody I know. Um, thank God I'm like, I don't need one right now. <laughs> oh, but, but I mean, why is that? Is it because their bones aren't strong because their joints wear out? Is there any connection to bone health? Is there anything people, because- Well, I mean- I yeah, know it's getting a knee replacement. So everything, everything, to, there's always an, a role that you play with your diet and exercise and then in the weight. Mm -hmm. And so weight- I mean, these are healthy people though. They're but, active, no, you know, but cheer, you, my friends. You can say, but, but it, it go to diet, exercise and weight. So you can narrow it. And then obviously, obviously there's a genetic component, familiar component. But what you're having is, is that those you're you're getting to the point where bone is rubbing against bone. Now, in the past, you know, you know, people were always having joint problems. And we weren't living that long, but we were living the same. Oh, yeah. well, my mama has had three knees at 90. So She's had three knees. Three knees at 90. So when did she yeah. start having knee problems? Probably, I think her first one was probably at at seventy, maybe. So you, but see yeah, what you know why? Yeah. No, actually, earlier than that, because her first one was Haley was a baby, and Haley's thirty one. Okay, so that point is is that now that was, people are living because because people had knee problems because you know my grandmother said, "Oh, I got you you got water on, I got water on the knee," so we always right. had osteoarthritic problems. But we really didn't have treatment options that were available that everyone could take advantage of. Right, 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 right. So what happens is is they be muscle through the pain and the discomfort, and yeah. they don't. Have pain. Now you have a treatment option that's kind of 
standard and that you can do but what but it does go back to you know weight plays a role um and then diet and exercise plays a role all the things that we talked about are playing a role but we are living longer mm -hmm. and now it's, and it's more it, knee, it's replacement, knee, knee replacement is more accessible we had a whole um decade of the bone like it's in 2000 2000 some 2000 2010 because that program sponsored by the NIH and the federal government was to bring to everyone's attention that we need to be take care of our bones. This is what's coming down the pipeline. You're going to be, you know, make sure you speak with your orthopedic doctor. All you, your bone health was important. And so that was that whole decade that we learned about the, about the importance. So now we're learning about bone health because that bone health aspect is more of a preventive okay okay so that could even help you with like the knee thing like if you do you have good yeah. knees yeah for right now <laughs> <laughs> see that see so tomorrow morning oh, she's, gonna wake up. she's okay. waking up tomorrow morning to go oh man my knee hurts Wait a minute. no problem i said really you know, i know so many people so many of my friends are like struggling with the knee mm -hmm. thing and so i just 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 uh, i want to just quickly run through some topics that we covered so we covered diet we know diet's going to be extremely important. Mm -hmm. and, Eat the calories. And, 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 and yes. And then try to ingest more calcium. Okay. And that's going to be important. And people have to, who are, who are lactose intolerant are going to have to be aware of that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, people that have a problem and they don't have drink a lot of dairy or eat a lot of dairy products are going to have a problem. Exercise, exercise, exercise. And exercise doesn't mean you're in a gym and, you know, lifting weights. Yeah. What did we just say? You walk to church. Mm -hmm. You walk, walk to, to church. The walk, store. walk your dog. Take a longer walk, walk with your dog. dog. Take a longer walk with your dog. Or you put your, try to get your five, 10,000 steps in. Supplements, supplements, supplements. What are the two major supplements that we've been talking about? Mm -hmm. Vitamin D, Vitamin D, D, D. And, and calcium. Calcium. Okay. And even if we are ingesting um dairy products we're still probably not, not ingesting the um, mm -hmm. amount of calcium that we need. Mm -hmm. and and there's the other thing that i wanted to flag we kind of briefly touched upon it was diseases lupus autoimmune diseases are impacting did you know that lupus is at a higher incidence in black women than are in white women yeah and it takes a long time to diagnose that that it's thing. a long time to diagnose it. If you're diagnosed, if you're on steroids for treatment, all of these impact your bone health. So I flagged that. And then don't forget the people that are suffering from sickle cell. You know, that kind yeah. of, a, we don't hear a lot about it, but again, sickle cell disease, their treatments and therapies are, are impact bone health. And I told you about vitamin D and we already know about how cancer, the cancer itself can impact bone health but also the treatments that are available. And mm -hmm. you have to be conscious of the fact that fractures take place, but there's these atypical fractures that could take place. So you have to talk with your doctor because what's important, especially for, for moms out there, if you have a fracture, you're out of the game for, for a period of time. And yeah, we it, get more debilitated and we die. Black women die, die from Black that. women die at a higher rate. Crazy. At a higher rate. That's crazy. But the numbers are, the statistics for that are crazy that we're dying from falling. Mm -hmm. and, and and in fact, you, you, we're dying from falling. The Black women are dying from falling. And also, they're not getting the appropriate care once they have the fracture. And, then, and it's not healing. Yeah. So Susan Johnson online says the average knee replacement costs anywhere from 40 to 60 grand. So unless you have insurance, you're not going to get it. And then we also had but, a comment. But, from, but if you, but if you, but if you, uh, if you above, uh, above, above 65. Right. And you have Medicare. Medicare. There's a lot of folks getting it out, you know, after 60. Yeah. So they can get a cut. Now get a people that are runners, you can, people that are, you know, runners, are getting it in their 40s more athletic people who are really traumatizing the bone yeah. yeah so 
So that's it. So it's not necessarily weight, um, but it's also joint use. Mm -hmm. And runners are getting it replaced too. Yeah. Athletes and stuff like that. So Keith, so if he has BRCA, um, what other diseases are connected to BRCA that Black people get besides breast cancer? Well, it's interesting that you say that. Um, prostate cancer. So let's prostate. Yes. Yeah. But see, 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 this is very interesting. We have a nomenclature or how we define disease. In the past, it was breast cancer. And then you have your treatment. Prostate cancer, you have your treatment. Pancreas, you have your pancreatic cancer, you have your treatment. And so those are related to the organs. Yeah. Now we're looking at gene mutations like BRCA mutations or HER mutations, HRR mutations, those type of mutations. And they're creating drugs that whether or not you have breast cancer or prostate cancer, it's the same drug. It, it's a PARP inhibitor. Can be used to treat breast cancer patients who have BRCA mutations. And, and okay. then they can't. You, you see that? And that's why this the future of, of medicine is moving to personalized, targeted, genomic based biomarker screening. The biology of your cancer cell. Biology yes. of your cancer cell. So let to it's the yes, I'm not saying to take away the 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 naming of the of the disease, like oh it's it's breast or it's ovarian versus, well, okay, first. Do you have a genetic mutation? And then do right. you have breast cancer? And that's that's why it's so important to get the genetic testing yeah. because the men and the women in your family can be affected. Right. And, and then right. what else? What and else? Can can what be else? Affected and affect each other. Right. And what that's what's what's very important, it, it, Ricky. Now think about this. So, um, a woman, a man who has prostate cancer that has a BRCA mutation can pass that BRCA mutation on to his daughter. Daughter, yeah. You see? And yeah. now- Or the wife could pass it on to her son. Her son. You see how that, so now that's why I said, now yeah. we're, we're, we're inheriting these genes. You've already right. said there's an inheritance pattern, right? Right. Associated with, with, with your cancer and your family. All right, I got another connection question for you. And then we, we're running out of time. I hate that. Um, All right. If, we, if we, 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 we don't want to match you. We don't want to match you. No. <laughs> if you have knee problems, can that ultimately cause a hip problem? Yes. Yeah. You know why? Because you can't walk. No. <laughs> it's because you, it's, so you can still walk, but the problem is, we walk, it's walking is like dancing. It's a rhythm, a symmetry in walking. The moment you start to hurt, that's like you got a corn on a, you got a corn on a toe. You're going to take the pressure off that right foot and put it on the left foot. Now that your mechanics start to shift. That yeah. means your muscles are yeah. going to shift and to support your body. And you're going to start leaning to one side to take the weight off of this, the, the pain yeah. you're experiencing. Yeah. So yeah. we have a, we we walk that we have symmetry when we walk. The moment we take away the symmetry, we damage something else. We start to lean and start yeah. to damage something else. So yeah. it's not so, symmetrical. So yeah. now the hip is off. Yep. Yep. So Gloria Broom, hey Gloria says, I had two knees now. Next month, left hip is there. Something I don't have to have it, but I'm dealing with now walking like a duck. God bless you, Gloria. So, so it, it's interesting when you in that. I'm gonna laugh at you, girl. I'm just and in, in that situation, you may want to talk with your doctor about you know first thing physical therapy to you know pre you know preempt this preventive physical therapy, but also whether or not you can use um, braces just before a surgical procedure. Um, you might want to be trained to walk correctly to get you know. Because pressure off. So say for example, you're walking and you have a your hip is your 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 right hip is has a lot of pain and they're going to replace that. That means you're leaning to your left, your left hip is compensating all that. 
So what has to happen is you have to train your body to go back to that normal balance. And that may be physical therapy. In the case of your knees, you may have to have a, a brace that kind of braces, brings very, everything back to symmetry. So it's very, it's very important for you to talk to your doctor about how to prepare, how to retrain your muscles and your body to accept this new, um, this artificial um, appendage or, 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 or uh, prosthesis. Oh my goodness. Well, mm -hmm. thank you for talking to us today and, um, and telling us your story. And, and I think, you know, we learned so much just in terms of Raqqa and what's going on in Africa and how, you know, even though people are sort of groomed to be healthier, they're still getting cancer and all these things and may not get the treatments they want, right? So we got to help them with that. So are, are we groomed to be healthier? I mean, because we, we we point at, you got your bio watches, you get to 10,000 steps in and we're going to the gym. Watches so we, do not work, you know, on black yeah. people. Oh, yeah. you know that, right? I mean, well, you know. You know that, everybody. The, the, the smart watches do not work on melanin. So don't count on that data being correct. Okay, well, I, I'm just that's saying, a whole other show. I'm just saying the biomarkers, all that stuff. I mean, the bio uh, metrics, all that stuff is out there. But the, at the end of the day, it's going back to what uh, if he said about going back to basics, dietary Talk basics. In the market, grow your vegetables. Mm -hmm. And then I, that's right. When you when you when you get your vegetable garden up and going, and you you need somebody to come by to kind of you know I'm not I'm in Boston, but you know I'll come <laughs> by get some vegetables. <laughs> But you can cook them. So. <laughs> I'll take some of that vegetable soup. That sounded good, too. Mm -hmm. You're welcome anytime. Okay. You heard that, Ricky. You heard that. <laughs> and you guys, check out check out our um, Touch um, Facebook page, and you'll see all the exciting things we're up against. We are all working on a Cancer Grand Challenge with Dr. Melissa Davis from Morehouse School of Medicine. And we are taking touch global and fen global global and you're already global if, if you'd really just to address can black the black cancers mm -hmm. breast, pol, um, breast um prostate and pancreatic cancers and we're going to be doing that in the u.s in the uk and then in ghana nigeria and um kenya south africa and zambia so so, so you know why this research is so important i mean internationally important is because 85% of all the genetic information related to cancers are based upon people of European ancestry. Yeah, we don't have the 14% from East Asian ancestry. And you can put black folks, diaspora black folks into like a 1% bucket. Yeah. So we don't have, this is going, this is a, a, a groundbreaking um, program Sorry. to start creating um, a link changing how we think about it changing how yeah, we think, think about, it. about it a link between uh, the origins of 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 the black diaspora with where we are today and yeah. how is it the environment you know epigenetics right that plays the role is it genetics like is the genetic? yep is it, it genetics, like the biology of the cancer cell mm -hmm. or all of these things right the mm -hmm. social determinants of health. All right, so you guys, we got to go. But Charlene, Charlene, we've been all over the board today, girl. So we're going to try to answer your questions. Mm -hmm. Can we talk a little bit about diabetes? So give a one, one like blurb on diabetes. It's all connected to food. Okay, there's two things. Or genetics, diabetes, right? Diabetes, well, food. And again, cancers like food, can't like, like um, sugar. And so having a very low glycemic index is very helpful when it comes to um, um, controlling um, not the symptoms of, of cancer, but, but decreasing the risk of cancer. And so again, all these things play a role in bone health mm -hmm. and in keeping your glucose low and controlling your glucose levels. So they're all inter, 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 intertwined. And, and that's what's important, especially for us, because our diets are, uh, we are exposed to a lot of sugar. So that wasn't even one sentence, that was like five sentences. But still, the point is yes, uh, maintain a uh, uh, good low glycemic index diets. 
Eat the vegetables, yeah. girl. Eat the vegetables, Charlie. Yeah. yeah. So let me add to what Dr. Kit uh, said. When uh, you have the diabetes and then you have cancer, um, of course, with uh, plastic surgery or any other surgery, healing. Yeah. Healing takes much longer. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Right. So, right. 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 It does take much longer. And now we're seeing this connection. And I think we'll be able to see this in, in our research study, you guys. Pancreatic cancer is connected to diabetes. Well, but see, but see, but see, you know what's so interesting is it's the literature has always said that. Yeah. Yep. And but nobody paid attention to it. And I think we're gonna find, I think it's gonna be more prevalent with black people. So. Right. And so and so now the major problem with the with the pancreatic is is that you can never catch it. So if you think of that quickly, if you think of pancreatic cancer as a like a flag, and the tail of the flag is where a lot of people get the cancer, you can't detect it. But if you had it at the where the pole is, where it's close to the intestines, then people detect it. But see, I think black folks, and this is what we have to find out, is a large incidence of their cancers are at, at the end. So it's always yeah. being detected at a late stage. And this the studies that yeah. we're doing will be able to look for biomarkers, biomarkers that are in the circulation that you can just pull yeah. out and look for it and see if you have you're at risk. Yeah. Yeah. So for another day, for another show. We might have to do we might have to do the challenge show and bone health. Okay. Okay. Oh, we're no, we're gonna do a challenge show soon. All right, we are. Okay. So thank you for hanging out with us today. And um we'll be back next month, first Sunday of the month. We're mm -hmm. a little we're a month we're a week late this time, but we will be there the first the first Sunday in April, and it's minority health month. So we're gonna have lots to talk about and tune into the doctor is in on um I think we're gonna talk about AI this Wednesday on the doctor is in, which really scares me, really scares me. And uh, and look for are you, inviting, at the are you inviting me to this one? Because you know I'm AI. Yeah. I'm all about AI. Okay. I know I got you. I wouldn't okay. do without you. Okay. All right. Okay. All right, you guys. Thank, thank, thank you, you so Black much. Form. Thank you, BlackDoctor.org. We love you so much. Thank you, Amgen. We love you so much for, for giving us a, a voice here. And um, we'll see everybody next month. And we'll see you on the doctor's in in a few days. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Right. Have you a good evening. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm still working. I'm still Keep working. Okay. You got it. Okay. You got it. You could tell her green. Bye. 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 Bye.